Well, um, welcome everyone um, to this uh, webinar series uh, from the Blue Economy CRC. Hopefully um, we've got everyone online. We've got quite a few participants today. Um, I think we had close to 500 registrations, which was really fantastic. Obviously there's a lot of interest in seaweeds. Uh, my name is Lindsay White. Uh, I'm a professor at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand, and I'm on the science executive of the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Center, which is um, hosted out of the University of Tasmania in Australia, as many of you will know. Uh, so the Blue Economy um, Cooperative Research Center is a very large 10-year um, endeavor um, to undertake the research necessary to take um, aquaculture uh, offshore uh, and marry that with marine renewable energy. Um, our, um, for those of you who aren't um, who aren't aware of, of the CRC, I'll give you a, a very brief introduction. We have um, five research programs within the CRC. Um, as I said, we're a 10 year um, research center um, and uh, we have five research programs, one on offshore uh, engineering, of course, um, seafood and marine products is our second research program. And um, I'm deputy lead of that along with uh, the program leader. Um, uh, um, and Research program three is offshore renewable energy systems, um, uh, environment and ecosystems for research program four and, and sustainable offshore developments. Um, our research program is, uh, as I said, taking aquaculture um, offshore. And part of that um, will include seaweeds, um, we hope. So today's presentation, if I could just grab the next slide there, Leslie. So today we've assembled um, a, a group of speakers who will speak to um, the possibilities of um, taking seaweed offshore in various ways. Um, first, we have uh, Brian von Hertzen from the Cl Climate Foundation, uh, Sonny Sanderson, who's representing Kelp Blue, um, Professor Greg Craig Johnson from UTAS, and Thomas uh, Remini from the so so uh, Southern Ocean Carbon Company. Um, so what we're going to do today is um, each speaker has about 15 minutes with about five minutes for Q&A afterwards. And that should leave a little bit of time um, for a, a more of a panel type discussion um, for those speakers who are able to stay with us. Um, just a, a little bit of housekeeping for those of you who would like to ask questions or to like to um, see your questions up in lights, please can you use the Q&A function, which is down the bottom um, of your Zoom window. Uh, and you can also, as if you keep the Q&A window open, you'll be able to see other people's Q&A uh, questions come up um, and you can um, um, so not add to the, the exactly the same uh, question if you like. So I think um, without further ado, we may um, turn now to um, Brian um, from the Climate Foundation. He's the executive director there. Um, and. Hopefully you guys have had a look at his um, brief summary uh, on the webinar page. Um, and Brian is going to talk to us um, today about what the Climate Foundation are up to. I think you can hand it over. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, it's a pleasure joining you today. And it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak uh, with the Blue Economy CRC and the larger audience regarding the potential for kelp reforestation across Australia and beyond, in particular with uh, marine permaculture, deep water upwelling. And it's great to be joining you from uh, sunny Queensland, where we have our international headquarters for the Climate Foundation. Uh, the Climate Foundation is focused on three major objectives, and that is ensuring food security for billions of people that rely upon the ocean for their sustenance, uh, ensuring enough food not only for humanity, but also for the ecosystems that include the kelp forests off Tasmania, the Great Barrier Reef, and ultimately even the tropical seaweed environments that are present in our present field working area in the uh, Philippines. And finally, to measure the carbon export of these regenerative interventions. Now, one of the reasons that we have major challenges here uh, in the oceans is that many of the marine ecosystems live within one degree of mortality each summer. And furthermore, 93% of the global warming that does take place um, is is absorbed in the upper layers of the ocean. And as a result, we have uh, higher temperatures and uh, really many of the marine ecosystems are on the front lines of climate disruption 
and present some of the most critical challenges of our time. A recent paper in Nature uh, just last November described the increasing stratification of the oceans, particularly in the tropics. Um, this density trend is very concerning because it actually governs the energetics of deep water um, natural upwelling. And this natural upwelling process has decreased over recent decades, uh, this, this analysis over the last half century. N squared is a measure of the stratification of the ocean. And this increase in stratification in the photozone, particularly in the tropical areas, 20 degrees north and south, but seasonally extending past 45 degrees north and south, where we've done some of our research on kelps, is a profound uh, effect and is something that we have to uh, keep centrally in mind. This schematic view of the world oceans exemplifies how this problem occurs not only in the Pacific Ocean, but also in uh, temperate and tropical latitudes in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans as well. And this stratification trend is a global trend that will ultimately shut down or decrease the natural upwelling that's occurring. This is so important because that upwelling is exactly what uh, determines the macronutrient availability for giant kelps, as well as aclonia and tropical red seaweeds. This example of ocean warming in Australia over the past decade resulted in a decimation of the clonia kelp forest as documented in Western Australia with nearly a thousand square kilometers lost during the uh, heat waves that occurred in the last decade. Uh, furthermore, off Eastern Australia, uh, over the last decade, we've seen three deg four degrees Celsius of warming, which is three to four times the rate that is observed in uh, more equatorial latitudes. And that's largely due perhaps to the variation and, and, and changes that we're seeing in the East Australian current. And that results in this research um, done by Professor Craig Johnson, uh, who will be speaking later today, on how the last few decades we've seen a decimation of the giant kelp forest uh, macrocystis off eastern Tasmania. And that's been matched by similar losses that have been observed in Northern California with the neurocystis kelp forest. And according to our colleagues, extends as far north as British Columbia, where up to 50% of the giant kelp has been lost in uh, various research locations uh, off the coast of Vancouver Island. So it's very concerning to understand that these losses are occurring up and down the temperate latitudes. We see this um, analogous problems that are occurring in Indonesia and in the Philippines, where um, in Indonesia during the heat waves of 2015 and 2016, we saw 60% loss in production and uh, roughly half of the seaweed farms on some of these islands went abandoned when the water was so warm that according to some of the local surfers, they didn't have to put on wetsuits that winter because um, the, the upwelling simply didn't occur. And so that stratification is a major concern. And it's actually confirmed by this uh, analysis by Lotzi in 2019 that shows for every degree of global warming, we have 5% less marine biomass. And that's an average across all latitudes. We expect that in uh, tropical and subtropical latitudes, the effect could be even more significant as the um, stratification is concentrated there initially. Now we're seeing a problem or an opportunity, and that is not only to address the food security challenges for humanity and for the ecosystems and ensure that we can uh, continue with a, a thriving uh, ecosystem in marine environments, but also to address carbon balance. And the entire uh, carbon in the atmosphere can be represented by this black uh, square here. And the challenge is to take roughly uh, uh, one third or one quarter of the uh, carbon in the atmosphere and return it to, um, to, to sequestered form. And uh, I'll note that this very large blue rectangle here represents all the dissolved in inorganic carbon in the sea. And so truly there's enormous um, room at the bottom as one of my advisors, uh, Richard Feynman used to say, uh, he was referring to small machines, but it may apply equally to the middle and deep ocean where in fact, we've got 38,000 gigatons of dissolved inorganic carbon today in the middle and deep ocean. And so the challenge is to restore the functioning of the biological pump with uh, macroalgae and algae of all kinds and really enable nature to do what uh, she's been doing for eons. And that is balancing carbon out of the photozone and into the middle and deep ocean, enabling a healthy biological pump to continue in spite of our times of climate disruption. Now there's roughly 45 times as much carbon in this uh, deep ocean and uh, between where I am uh, now in Queensland and my home state of California, uh, there's approximately 100 million square kilometers of accessible open ocean area that David Attenborough characterizes as mostly empty ocean. So the problem of carbon in the ocean is not that of the entire amount, but of that of its distribution. 
and ensuring a healthy biological pump that can rebalance carbon from the photozone back into the middle of deep ocean presents a distinct opportunity today. Fortunately, we have the help of kelp forests, which surprisingly managed to uh, fix approximately 15% more carbon per square meter than even the tropical rainforest, as evidenced by this um, bar, large bar at the second from the bottom. Now, if we're able to um, restore initially, and perhaps later even increase or augment the number of square kilometers that are available for a kelp forest, for example, we can fix uh, large amounts per square meter of kelp and restore those ecosystem services and perhaps get back to pre-industrial levels or even uh, beyond that at some point. So a natural kelp forest has uh, some natural sequestration that's been researched by a number of groups uh, and enables um, the, the macrocystis and other kelp that's uh, normally growing, eventually some of a subset of it can flow out to sea, it can sink, and it can be sequestered in the deep sea. Perhaps uh, 10 to 30% of that carbon could actually be buried in the sediments, but the majority of that carbon would actually be remineralized in the form of deep CO2, and that deep CO2 is dissolved and it travels with the deep ocean currents until the outcrop to the surface again. Later, I'll show some of the analysis that shows that this deep seaweed has resonance times of hundreds to thousands of years and represents a distinct opportunity to rebalance carbon from that perspective. So in Santa Barbara, California, we've seen a decimation of the kelp, in fact, two of them, one of them associated with the climate warming of the past couple of decades, but one before uh, early in the early 1900s was associated with the advent of farming and siltation and runoff and the loss of visibility resulted in the juvenile kelps not being able to grow from a depth of 25 meters to the surface due to light limitation. And there was literally in the 1800s, a continuous river of kelp uh, from Point Concepcion nearly to the Mexican border that was nearly a kilometer wide in some cases, this chart from 1868. And so we asked the question, what if we could restore kelp forests back to their original pre-industrial scale nearly 200 years ago? And from that perspective, we see the greatest opportunity is to provide substrate and deep water irrigation to uh, kelp forests offshore and these, um, these substrates could in fact restore ecosystem services without impacting the shoreline greatly. And that's our vision for marine permaculture going forward. Pre-industrially, offshore winds would provide plenty of upwelling to the surface on a regular basis. However, in a, in a warmer world, the thermocline is deeper, the temperatures are warmer, and we get upwelling failure, which is a significant limitation to making progress uh, on, on regenerating these ecosystems. Marine permaculture restores uh, the natural upwelling using wind energy, wave energy, and solar energy in the tropics to actually provide the replete irrigation <clears throat> that's needed for these kelp forests to thrive with a proper amount of nutrients. Um, and viewed uh, globally, um, this, this could be done at scale in deep ocean and ultimately can uh, regular uh, partial harvest can take place. And those partial harvests can provide initially food, feed, and fertilizer products with the residual seaweed that's not used for food, feed, and fertilizer that can be sunk. And the key thing is to um, track the carbon and the phosphorus. It turns out if you, want to, uh, if you want to track the carbon, it's great to measure the phosphorus because this carbon to phosphorus ratio determines the amount that's upwelled and the amounts that downwelled. And the good news is that for kelps and red seaweeds of most all kinds, the uh, carbon to phosphorus ratio is two to seven times higher than it is for uh, the upwelled water, which provides a net uh, carbon sink for that fraction of the seaweed that is fixed, and the fat fraction of the phosphorus that is fixed in the seaweed, and the fraction that gets sunk to the deep ocean with uh, event horizons of either 300 meters for century long sequestration or 1,000 meters for um, century for millennial sequestration. So, this presents a number of commercial uses that are available, and we begin with food, feeder, and fertilizer applications. And there are further applications that are a potential after that. We see one of the potentials. This is a venerable steamship kelp cutter of uh, perhaps 100 years ago off the coast of San Diego. Uh, what's interesting is that with a biorefinery technology that's available in Australia today, this example is the Shell Prelude, which produces uh, liquefied natural gas. However, with a much smaller and much simpler at sea biorefinery, we can produce food, feed, fuel, and fertilizer, and uh, residual seaweed that is not used for those applications can be returned to the deep sea, uh, returning the carbon from whence it originally came. So from that perspective, we see a sustainable opportunity for at sea refineries. We would like to measure that carbon using existing technology of sediment traps, uh, robotic gliders, and ultimately uh, deep uh, biogeochemical Argo floats. And we note that the literature has acknowledged that 
uh, the 300 meter depth horizon by me measuring and tracking the seaweed through 300 meters, we can get an export time scale of 100 years. And by tracking it through 1,000 meters, we get uh, on the order of 1,000 year time scales. In fact, this radiocarbon dating of deep abyssal waters 1,000 meters and deeper show the contour lines that these deep red lines are approaching 2,400 years in, in age and radiocarbon age. So literally dropping seaweed off of Australia and uh, letting it uh, letting that deep carbon eventually drift its way or to the Northeast Pacific represents sequestration times of many centuries uh, with the standard abyssal ocean currents. The um, US Department of Energy Mariner program has acknowledged that we could potentially scale this in the coming decade to perhaps even gigaton scale. And that would be a significant development and would use uh, only one or one and a half percent of the EEZ of large countries like Australia, big ocean nations that have the opportunity to do this. And this applies for a lot of small island developing states that also have millions of square kilometers of accessible area. At, at the Climate Foundation, we've developed uh, the marine permaculture in four phases. We began with research uh, partnered with the University of Hawaii, where we actually completed upwelling testing and verified the growth of algae. Uh, furthermore, in phase two, we've been doing trough-based studies that have validated the commercial, the growth of commercially relevant seaweeds uh, to deep water irrigation. And now we're working to scale towards a hectare scale because now that we've validated the growth of those seaweeds, uh, we're able to scale to a commercially relevant hectare and ultimately could go to multiple hectare scale in the years to come. This uh, experiment was done in, uh, in mesoscale uh, troughs that were uh, using deep water on the left with a thermograph uh, several degrees cooler than on the right. And we were able to get double and quadruple the production. This particular chart shows the uh, growth rate more than, more than uh, tw twice uh, the growth or twice the, the biomass accumulation, um, twice the original biomass, I should say, more than 100% growth in one month. And those are represented by the dark, uh, highly pigmented seaweeds that have a lot of phytonutrients, omega-3 um, fatty acids and antioxidants compared to the much lighter colored seaweeds on the right that represent these uh, control studies. As a result, uh, we're enthusiastic about growing both tropical seaweeds and potentially brown kelps uh, that uh, can benefit from this deep water irrigation. Um, Professor Craig Johnson uh, will, uh, will show you this work that was also done with uh, Dr. Craig uh, Kane Layton. And uh, this showed the growth of um, macrocystis uh, uh, in some zones in, in Tasmania. And uh, Professor Johnson will tell you more about that. We'd like to show you uh, an image or a vision for uh, how we see this playing out at hectare scale in the years ahead. We can see leverage- The Climate Foundation, CH4 Global and Hatch are developing marine permaculture architecture to grow seaweed offshore. Like rough water fish pen designs, this ring structure can withstand offshore storm conditions. The two rings protect the central floating solar panels, which provide energy for deep water irrigation of temperate kelp or tropical red seaweeds growing in the outer circle. Such irrigation enables seaweed to thrive offshore, opening up new regions for cultivation. These platforms also enable faster growth and partial harvest cultivation, resulting in higher yields and less labor, while sustaining three or four seasons of harvest per year. The single point anchoring allows the platform to pivot freely. The Climate Foundation has raised funds to build a 100 square meter prototype, which can be scaled up to 1,000 square meters as a stepping stone to our next goal of an economically sustainable hectare. We look forward to developing a scalable and sustainable marine permaculture industry together. Thank you. So from this perspective, we see the potential to leverage existing- um, The Climate Foundation. <laughs> there we go. Existing uh, fish pen technology that has proven uh, performance at uh, in 10 meter seas and greater. Uh, ultimately, we see it at uh, hectare scale and ultimately 100 hectare scale uh, that we can potentially grow thousands of tons of seaweed, dry, dry metric tons per uh, square kilometer per year. And furthermore, uh, that can also fix potentially several thousand tons of carbon dioxide per square kilometer per year as well. And the potential fish harvest could be measured in several hundred tons. So we see this as a major economic opportunity going forward. We're looking forward to working with the Blue, Blue Economy CRC to enable the scaling and transition to uh, commercial production. And we see this as an opportunity across Australia and beyond to really scale this as we go forward. Now we see we're, we're um, currently in progress in developing a working group for kelp blue carbon. Uh, we'd like to do that in partnership with Blue Economy CRC. And I would welcome you to get in touch with us 
to really uh, work on developing the scientific basis for long-term uh, deep ocean storage. Furthermore, to uh, develop a prioritization with the Australian government clean energy regulator to uh, really set kelp blue carbon as a priority for the coming fiscal year to ensure that we can accelerate kelp blue carbon methodology development within the Australian uh, carbon credit unit framework for the Australians nationally determined contributions to the Paris commitments. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Lindsay, and thank you very much for your attention and happy to uh, discuss questions further. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian, um, for that presentation. Um, I'm hoping there's a, a, a few questions going to come out. Well, someone has asked about, um, rather than, I guess, deep water irrigation, what's the um, uh, what's the possibility of, of seeding with things like iron or other nutrients? Have, have you thought about? I think you're on mute there, Brian. Uh, so it's a good question. In the near term, I think it's easier for us to move forward without adding any external nutrients. We're cognizant of the um, London Protocol. And the key thing about that is that uh, developing uh, mariculture is considered to be allowed under the London Protocol. And our primary purpose is mariculture to create food, feed, and fertilizer for humanity and also regenerate uh, ecosystem services. So we see that's our primary objective. Measuring the carbon export will be helpful, but we believe that that can be done simply by ensuring that we can restore the natural upwelling <laughs> that can ensure a thriving kelp forest and thriving tropical seaweed forest for years to come. So that's where we'd look to start. And uh, we don't see the need to, uh, to, to do other interventions at this time. Um, so I've got another question about during some of the experiments that you've already done, um, have you looked at the amount of organic carbon dissolved and particulate that was upwelled along with the nutrients? Well, that's a very good question. Most of the carbon that's upwelled is coming from middle and, and uh, deep ocean, but that's still substantially off the seafloor. So most of the carbon that's coming up is DIC, dissolved inorganic carbon in the form of dissolved carbon dioxide. That uh, probably is exceeding any organic carbon by one or two orders of magnitude. So as shown in one of my slides, the carbon to phosphorus ratio is perhaps 117 to one. The reason phosphorus is such a useful tracer is that it doesn't go into the atmosphere. It remains uh, in, in the water. And so tracking the phosphorus and the ultimate fate of the phosphorus can determine the associated carbon with it. And so that carbon, uh, that phosphorus that is uh, entrained into the macroalgae gets uh, fixed at a ratio of perhaps 220 to one for macrocystis, all the way up to 800 to one for some red seaweeds and even some brown seaweeds. Now, um, the, red, the balance of that phosphorus is um, taken up by microalgae, for example, and we assume that's done at just a nominal ratio of 117 to one. So it's, it's over the last decade been acknowledged that it's a zero sum game uh, nominally for, ma for microalgae, but the macroalgae present a distinct premium in terms of carbon to phosphorus ratio. And that's where the net benefit is really provided. And that's enough to more than make up for any organic carbon that might be up well in the process, which we can measure as part of, and do course as part of the uh, operation. Okay, yeah, we've got a couple more questions coming in. I mean, here's here's one that I've been asked quite a few times. So um, what would, uh, if, if you were sinking tons of seaweed to the to the abyss, to the sea floor, what does that do to promote anoxic regions in the deep, deep ocean? Well, that's a very good question. Um, we have plenty of oxygenation today from the Antarctic bottom water that provides high oxygen levels on the sea floor. And one reason to use a uh, floating out sea biorefinery is it just like the plankton flora forests that naturally occur in upwelling regions, the, uh, the, the marine snow, if you will, is distributed across vast ocean areas. And so part of the protocol that we would propose is one where, in fact, any sinking of residual seaweed would be done over a broad distributed area. And furthermore, ongoing oxygen measurements would uh, show the healthy levels of oxygen that would remain after, um, you know, after this had taken place. Pre-industrially, there were maybe 500 times as many whales as there are today. Every whale fall represents a huge amount of carbon that's sunk to the seafloor. And this uh, pales in comparison in terms of a bale of, of seaweed, for example, that would be on, on the seafloor. So it's something that can be monitored and that would be part of the uh, methodologies that we would propose going forward. Okay, we've probably got time for a couple more. Um, what is the minimum depth you're considering? this kind of activity? 
Um, it depends on latitude. We found that uh, upwelling from 100 meters to 300 meters uh, is, is very helpful in terms of having uh, suitable nutrient levels for uh, deep water irrigation of seaweed. And then furthermore, sequestration depths of 300 to 1,000 meters are useful as well. And so uh, it doesn't take that much depth to get uh, a, a substantial increase in nutrients. And our initial studies with the, our partners at the University of Tasmania and IMAS have uh, validated that, in fact, uh, upwelling from depths of 100 to 150 meters could probably uh, produce usable results uh, off of the coast of Tasmania, for example. OK, look, we've got a whole slew of questions here. And I think what we'll do is we might move on um, to our next speaker. And I'll um, while that speaker is talking, I'll take a look at these questions and, and try to sort through them. Um, so uh, thank you thank very Lindsay. much. Uh, yeah, thank and, you and much, I'll, I'll try to answer some of them in, in writing as well. So thank you, Lindsay. Oh, terrific. OK. So thank you very much, Brian. Uh, our next speaker um, is um, from Kelp Blue, uh, Dr. Uh, Sunny Sanderson, who's their Director of Environmental and, Sus and Social Sustainability. Um, and hopefully you guys have checked out the Kelp Blue website and have um, figured out a little bit about what they're about. And I'm going to hand it over to Sunny to, um, to tell us. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, firstly, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I think this is a really interesting and important panel, and I feel very lucky to come after Brian. I'm sure you've fielded a whole range of questions <laughs> that you're far more experienced to answer than I. Um, so I will just want to give you a bit more of a general overview of who we are and the plans that we have moving forward in Australia and also New Zealand. So let me just share my screen. How's that, Lindsay? Yeah, great. Great. So uh, as Lindsay said, I'm from Kelp Blue 42. The 42, 42 is the latitude where we'll be looking at now in Tasmania and New Zealand. Um, so essentially, what we do is we're a restorative large scale offshore. And the track a range of other products like textiles and alternatives to plastic, um, which will displace environmentally damaging alternatives. So just to give you a little bit more of a background, and before I move on, the key premise for how we are founded is for these large things of carbon sequestration and also boosting biodiversity and fish stocks in the regions where we work. So just so you know a little bit more about us, our first project is actually kicking off in Namibia. So we're pretty young, we're a startup. We began at the beginning of last year, right in time for COVID. This has been sort of a twin edge sword in that it's created a range of massive challenges for people we work with and communities where we are. Uh, but in many ways, it's also broken down a whole lot of barriers for us to communicate with a wide range of people very quickly. So for our initial project, We've already in Namibia, um, firstly, we've secured all our licenses and we're about to start. And we're funded by climate fund managers and EOS Capital and have received up to US $60 million for the project over there. Also at the end of last year, we were asked to speak at the United Nations Global Compact for Sustainable Ocean Business. And together with other amazing seaweed entrepreneurs and innovators, um, work together to put forward the Seaweed Manifesto, which is a collaborative work that was initiated by Lloyd's Register Foundation. So earlier this year uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, we were also selected within their second cohort of one of 11 startups um, recognized for our positive impact on ocean health. So just very briefly, how do we come to actually do this? Um, our fan founder, Daniel Hoft, he uh, has a very long background, 20 years in fact, working for Shell. So as you can see from the map below across the world and through a series of um, different interactions, came across Tim Flannery's book, Sunlight and Seaweed, and saw this as a really, um, 
elegant and innovative solution for a range of issues that we have in terms of climate change and biodiversity. So essentially, long story short, Kelp Blue was founded at the beginning of 2020. Now, something that's really, I find very inspiring about this company is we all have a very diverse background, which I think is really important that we're a multidisciplinary group with deep experience across a wide range of sectors from you know, fast moving consumer goods, NGOs, oil and gas, telecommunications, academia and research, because it means that, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> Everybody has a place at the table and we have a broader range of ideas for understanding how is the best way to move forward. So in terms of myself, how I came to be with Kelp Blue, uh, my background uh, is more in tropical rainforests, so it's quite different. Uh, firstly with orangutan and gibbon research, but then uh, in my doctorate really looking at what are the impacts and consequences of large scale agriculture on native customary rights landowners. So this is the lens that I bring to Kelp Blue is understanding what these large scale projects may mean for the communities where we work. So why giant kelp? So we just deal with Macrocystis periphera. Um, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted in that, as you'd know, kelp is an incredibly fast growing seaweed that has the ability to draw down more CO2 than terrestrial forests while also boosting marine um, biodiversity. Given the right conditions in the wild, uh, there are regions where it grows to over 65 meters tall and forms really um, large complex forests. Uh, and in the right conditions, it can grow up to 60 centimetres a day. So these forests actually provide nursery grounds uh, that shelter a really wide range of species from macro, you know, right down to tiny micro, which is really important. And as such, they're known as ecosystem engineers. Uh, they also have large positive impacts on the surrounding ecosystems uh, in terms of water filtration, uh, nitrogen removal, habitat provision, and a whole range of things that Brian also outlined prior to me. Now, um, just I guess basically because I love this image from California. left a field for what a normal private sector company would be, but uh, a key premise of what we're doing really is around the sustainable development goals of climate action, uh, life below the water, but also just as importantly, um, providing both direct and indirect work opportunities for the communities where we are. And in the long term, um, moving towards that responsible consumption and production of different um, goods on the value chain. Okay, so what makes us different? Now, I guess first up, just that you have an idea, our scale in Namibia, just our pilot study alone is going to be um, about one hectare, but we'll be scaling up to 800 hectares there. Uh, the way we do this, um, we're kind of removing the barriers to scale, which can be a challenge for some of your inshore, um, more traditional seaweed methods. Uh, we do this by cultivating offshore. So this will be between five and 10 kilometers offshore and between about 50 to 150 meters deep. So essentially uh, we secure the arrays to the ocean floor. How we do this really may vary in different areas because of course we complete very in-depth bathymetric surveys and need to understand local conditions. But then essentially what happens is we have these grids. So each of those little squares you see is about four by four meters because first and foremost in our mind is how do we think about reducing marine entanglements um, as well. Uh, again, we've chosen Macrocystis as what's been shown already. It appears that it has between a seven and 20 year lifespan. So that removes that issue that you have in some other areas where you're having to annually reharvest and reseed the arrays. So for us, it means that um, the, the actual forest is in the water longer to help promote those environmental benefits. So as you'll see, the kelp will grow up to 20 meters. And then we basically just take the top meter to a meter and a half. 
uh, three to four times a year. So that initial processing will be done on the ship and then the rest will be in facilities on. Thing new, uh, as Brian showed before in that beautiful photo, and here is another one actually of a kelp harvesting barge in Tasmania in the 70s. Um, it's an idea and a technology that's been around for a long time. The key difference is we do not harvest from wild populations. So it will be um, macrocystis that we've cultivated into forests ourselves. So a little less stylized picture for you. This is actually from Namibia, one of our earlier sketches. Um, so there we'll be looking at a water depth of 80 meters. And this one is about 300 meters long as well. So in terms of Australia, uh, I just want to really put out there, it's very early days. Um, I'm currently uh, just in due diligence trying to get the know of the landscape as best as possible in both areas. And we're doing a large mapping drive to really properly understand the conditions. So this blue, they're vast areas, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, but already we're finding challenges. So Tasmania, as you'd well know, has lost huge portions of its uh, native kelp forests. Um, and has the kind of uh, issues, as Brian said, with um, ocean hotspots, uh, as well as some other things and, and what appears to be low nutrients as well. So we're also in due diligence in New Zealand, um, highly likely off the east coast of the South Island. Now, just in terms of those products from what we harvest, uh, of course, initially it will be biostimulants and feed supplements, but we're also in talks with a range of different companies in Europe. So I think it's a really an interesting time to be in because there's some very inspirational, incredible startups. So we have the good fortune to um, talk with Nopla, which is a company that uh, you can't even say it's a bioplastic, it's not a plastic, as they say, not pla, um, for packaging, but then there's also a lot of scope in textiles, so with alginets and then down the track with biomedicals and, and a whole range of different uses. So just briefly, um, so you get an idea of our structure, we have kelp 42 and under that we'll have and Something I'm really excited about is we have developed the Kelp Forest Foundation. So this is um, a Netherlands registered nonprofit charity. So it is set up originally by Kelp Blue, but it is independent of us. And the key aims are to boost knowledge um, through science and technology and existing um, collaborations and work that's done um, to kind of really look at the uh, viability and value of giant kelp cultivation as a powerful nature-based solution. And everything that we do, it's really important for us that it's very open and it's transparent. So uh, a key premise of this is academic research, which will all be open access. So for example, in Namibia, because we're further along there, um, we already have a number of master's students selected in advertising and a PhD student and the work that they do will be around things like how do you quantify carbon sequestration, um, how do you actually quantify the biodiversity impacts, will be they positive, negative, and a wide range of monitoring, but also developing methodologies because there's a lot of talk about um, blue carbon credits and the price of carbon and that type of thing, but the science just isn't there yet. So we have the good fortune to also work with um, Carlos Duarte and a range of incredible researchers. So in Tasmania alone, um, you have some incredibly skilled people and also in uh, New Zealand that are really at the forefront of what's going on. Uh, another key thing for us is really thinking about um, digital ecosystem and oceanographic monitoring and blue tech and R&D and that type of thing. Because I think in the offshore space, you have to ensure that it's safe um, for the environment, for the community and for the people that have to work out there. And I also think it really needs to be done in a way where people can know what we're doing. It can't simply be a matter of out of sight, out of mind and, and business as usual won't suffice anymore. So, 
Uh, we're also doing a range of social outreach programs and um, the Kelp Forest Foundation will also be doing some research expeditions with a carbon neutral boat to actually travel around the globe to the places where kelp is still growing um, to help develop the seed bank and things like that. So just because I like nice pictures, um, again, the key premise for us and also with the Kelp Forest Foundation is these points of carbon sequestration, boosting biodiversity, which will also um, hopefully boost fish stocks in the areas where we work, capacity building through encouraging research and collaboration um, and different programs, but also within those coastal communities, boosting employment opportunities, both um, directly and indirectly as well. So our vision in Australia, just until 2029, is we will be looking at doing 500 hectares in Australia and 500 hectares in New Zealand, providing that the conditions are right. Um, a wide range of employment opportunities and also quantifying and developing methodologies for that carbon sequestration as well. Um, I guess just lastly, our overall vision for Kelp Blue, we really want, um, you know, by 2050 to be having a large area of cultivated kelp forests, drawing down large amounts of CO2 and boosting biodiversity, but also for us, um, in addition to that and being employment centres, we really want to be known as a company that um, helps with innovation and vision and um, it's not something that can be done alone. But if we can be open and transparent in the way we are doing it, then people can learn from what we do, be that you know, the mistakes, the positives, and also the research that we use. So with that, I will leave it there and attempt to <laughs> stop sharing. Okay, is that done, Lindsay? Yeah, thank you very much, Sunny, for that um, presentation. Um, We've got lots and lots of questions. I, I should say that um, if you could please keep your questions into the Q&A rather than the chat window. Um, and then um, our speakers are, um, are sort of can go through and actually answer some of the questions that are un unique to them. Um, and some of the questions, as you can see, if you open the Q&A window have already been answered. Um, and so you can sort of go through that. And I think what we'll do afterwards is we'll collate these in some way and put some sort of FAQ on offshore seaweed uh, aquaculture on, onto the website associated with this. Um, so a, a lot of the questions are sort of uh, generic. Um, there's one um, here, why is Kelp Blue chosen a 500 hectare uh, as the size of area under cultivation and its vision? So what, where, does, where does that come from? Where's the... Um, I think for our initial moving forward to 2029, it, it's an attainable goal. So of course we don't want to be thinking too large, but also um, maybe a bit arbitrary, but that's basically mod based off modeling of what we will be doing in Namibia, where it'll be scaling to 800 hectares. Um, I think in say Tasmania and Australia, there's the additional challenge where it may take more long, uh, sorry, more long, longer as the kind of the regulatory framework's not in place yet for being securing licenses and things like that. So it just may take longer in itself to, to get moving. So there's a question and, and I know you're not a seaweed biologist, but I'm going to throw it to you anyway, Sunny, um, around, around um, harvest, the way you harvest Macrocystis periphera. So you're, you're talking about going through a kelp forest and taking the top metre to a metre and a half off. And, and Brian mentioned this as well. And, and that's sustainable, so that this particular seaweed grows in a way that you can sort of mow the lawn like that? Um, so it has been done previously. So in California, they used to do it uh, the coast during the war for making pot ash. Um, the stipes that you cut will senesce uh, as well, but then it will keep growing it in itself. Yeah, sorry, I, that was a bit mean to throw that to, to <laughs> a non cv biologist. But yes, for those who are watching who who uh, who aren't aware, uh, yeah, macrocystis porifera uh, can indeed be harvested sustainably, just like mowing the lawn, um, and has been done in a number of countries for for decades. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
That's all right. One, Throw them at me, Lindsay. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> One thing I should point out to, to the folks watching is that uh, all three of the companies that are presenting today, so the Southern Ocean Carbon Company, Kelp Blue, Blue 42 and, and the Climate Foundation, are all um, going to be hopefully associated with um, the Blue Economy CRC and engaged in some R&D projects around taking this, this um, uh, seaweed culture offshore. Um, and so that's, I guess that's the, the connection with the CRC that I probably should have made and didn't make at the beginning. Um, we might um, then move on. Um, thank you, Sonny, very much. And we're going to move on. And some of some of the questions that are being asked are about to be asked, uh, answered, I suspect, by um, Professor Craig Johnson. Um, Craig's from, from UTAS. He's currently their Executive Director of Innovation and Enterprise. But of course, he's got a, a long um, resume um, and working with um, lovely seaweeds. Um, and Craig's going to talk to us about future proofing um, the Macrocystis uh, aquaculture uh, in Southeast Australia. So I might just hand it over for Craig and hopefully he'll get in and answer some of these questions uh, for us in the Q&A. Thanks, Lindsay. Is that showing all right? That, yeah, that's uh, fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I just want to start out by acknowledging that it was Kane Layton and Masayuki Tatsumi who actually did most of the hard yards um, in the water and in the lab on this project. I also want to um, acknowledge the support we had from, for the project from Climate Foundation, Hewan Aquaculture, the uh, NESP Marine Biodiversity Hub here in Australia, and also from NRM South. But I thought I'd kick off um, in a similar way to Brian for a little bit of background with this trace um, that runs from 1950 in the blue through to uh, about 2010 and if you follow those colours you can see it's from this bottom corner up to the top corner here so over that time period um, these waters off Mariah Island uh, here in eastern Tasmania have gotten warmer a couple of degrees warmer and more saline and the only explanation of that TS signature is increased influence of the East Australian current and that's now been well demonstrated by um, people with much more oceanography experience than I have. And the key message in this with EAC water is that it's not only warmer, um, which, is give, which is why this area is now one of the global hotspots, um, as Brian said, about four times the global average uh, in terms of the warming rate, but it's also characterised by um, you know, very low nitrogen, in other words, low nutrient. That's an issue for macrocysts because it doesn't store nitrogen very well. Across the same time frame, uh, Brian also showed this. These are, this is the results of looking at uh, archival aerial photos at these seven sites in eastern Tasmania. And you can see that the direction of these um, uh, giant floating canopies has only gone in, in, uh, in one direction. So over a 95% loss there. If we look at the picture, the total picture for Tasmania, um, this is a shorter time frame because it's uh, driven by the availability of the satellite images, the Landsat images. We did this work um, with, with uh, a 30 by 30 metre pixel size right around, the, right around um, Tasmania. And you can see it's, the, it's really the same story. Lots of kelps everywhere with, um, although there's been some reasonable recovery in the Bruni bioregion of Tas. Um, but for most, of, for most of the area, there's been a massive drop in the amount of kelp. So the issues then, um, both Sonny and Brian have spoken uh, you know, pretty well about, about why macrocystis is an ideal species for kelp aquaculture, kelp, uh, growing kelp, you know, for a number of reasons. And you think, well, why would you want to do that here in Southeast Australia and in Tasmania in particular? We would first need to future-proof future against this ongoing warming. The question there is, can we select for warm tolerant strains of macrocystis? And the other question um, that we would need to address is this question of nutrient limitation. Um, so I'm just going to talk about both of those things for the rest of the talk. In terms of selection for warm tolerance, one of the things we observe is that if you go back to the areas that used to support these large kelp forests, these big, dense, iconic forests, not all of the kelp is gone. You can find remnant individuals um, that actually look in physiologic, to be physiologically in good health, well pigmented, growing okay, and we surmise that these were probably genotypes um, that were more tolerant to, uh, to warming than those that had been lost. So at six sites, three up here in the north of the state, three down in the south of the state, we sampled seven individual kelps, uh, took the sporophylls, the spores from those, um, 
and grew them up um, in the lab. Later, I'm going to talk about two restoration, the transplant restoration sites, and that's at these two sites down here in, in southern Tasmania. So having harvested those spores, we generate the gametophytes under red light and then ran a common garden experiment. That's, you can see this design here in the, um, uh, in the circle. Uh, and, and that represents uh, four different temperature baths in which we grew each of these 42 uh, different kelp lines plus various um, outcrossings of, of those. And the results are here. Um, on the left here, these are the graphs. This is sporophyte density up top, sporophyte size down here. These are just the microsporophytes that we're growing up um, on these um, small slides. And you can see that there's, it's quite clear as expected that sporophyte density and size decline with temperature. Um, and it doesn't matter which site, these are the different sites, these different colors from the north and the south, doesn't matter which site they came from, that happened. But the key thing is, some survived and, were, and, and grew you know, quite well at remarkably high temperatures. You know, we never experience, uh, not for very long anyway, you know, 20 degrees and certainly never 24 degrees. Mostly, mostly what we're experiencing is um, you know, through to about 18 degrees or so. So, so 20 is very warm and 24 is boiling hot in, in for Tasmanian um, kelps. And yet we have some here that are doing you know, quite well with that. This is probably the interesting result here. And here we're plotting sporophyte size um, versus sporophyte density um, that are growing, of these microsporophytes growing, growing in this um, common garden uh, experiment at these different temperatures. And what you can see is that the warm tolerant lines grow more densely and larger. So in other words, these lines are all positive slopes. So what this means is that you know, these ones up at the end here uh, the warm top, this one up here. These are, the, these are the ones that are doing well, both in terms of density, there's lots of them, and in the size that they're doing. Um, the, the importance of this positive slope is that any differences in the cultures can't be sort of due to random differences um, in the stage or the timing on, on what you might normally expect in this sort of situation, you know, some sort of self, self thinning um, trajectory. So it looks like that 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 these, um, these genotype lines that are doing better, that this is real. This is not just, um, this is not just sort of random variation uh, in a self-thinning uh, trajectory. Um, another thing we found from this, I don't have time to go into the details, is that the outcrosses did better than the self lines and perhaps that's, um, perhaps that's uh, something that you might expect as well. But look, the great thing is that we selected the, these warm tolerant genotypes and last October, not the right time of the year to be doing it, we put them out. So you, this is a 40 by 40 metre plastic plate here that's just been drilled into the reef. And you can see these tiny little microsporophytes on it. Um, by the time, uh, this is the so, sort of size they were um, in February. And the key thing is you can see that these uh, individuals are really healthy looking algae. They're well pigmented, they're growing well, and the nearby natives um, at this site, at the same, exact same depth, were noticeably bleached, necrotic. You handle them, they just disintegrate. So it's really quite clear to us that these selected lines that we had here were doing so much better than the, um, the native genotypes uh, that were there in the same area. And Kane visited this site just um, recently, uh, and uh, both of these sites. And these kelps are now pl you know, planted in October, and in June they are up around six to seven metres in, uh, in, in height. So they're they're really doing really well, and this was a great outcome for us. Now to the effects of um, of nutrients. So this was some work that we did uh, in the human aquaculture salmon lease sites to the east of. North Bruny Island. So here's a bunch of these lease sites here. Um, in this lease site here, there were a heap of pens. They're the little circles. Uh, and we put our kelp out, uh, only those little microsporophytes, about a millimetre, two millimetres high um, at this site. But then also in this fallowed lease site here, and at one of these fallowed sites, there's no added nutrient at all. At all. The kelps just go out on the lines. Um, and at this site here, um, it also in the fallowed site, but every few metres along the line, we hung a little, a little uh, 
uh, canvas bag with about 500 grams of slow release osmocote as a, as a low level source of um, nitrogen. For scale here, it's about two kilometers from um, uh, the site near the pens down to this fallowed area. And these two here are about five, 600 meters apart. Let's have a look at nutrient levels, um, standing concentrations. I'm just gonna focus on nitrogen. You see here, I put a dotted line at one micromolar. Um, and that's because it's about one micromolar that these kelps need um, to grow. So it's kind of a critical value. Um, in February, uh, both ammonium and uh, nitrate, uh, NOx, nitrate, nitrite, uh, were well below that. Not surprisingly here, we find uh, this around the salmon pens, a higher level of um, ammonium. Um, so that's salmon pens. The green is the fallowed without the added nutrients and the blue is the fallowed with the osmocote. But if you jump to about a year later, at a similar time down the bottom here, you can see that the, the levels are way higher and unexpectedly, it's the fallowed sites that have, are showing much more ammonia in those water samples. Um, in October, uh, again, not much difference between here, between the fish pen and the fallowed site, but it was the fallowed site with the added nutrients that was high in ammonia. So it's really hard to interpret this stuff. It looks like a lot of space-time variation. So I spoke to my colleagues at IMAS, um, Jeff Ross and Camille White, who are working with CSIRO on an FRDC project, and they have access to um, uh, a continuous sampling inline um, auto analyzer, and they're producing data that looks something like this. So I'm thanking these guys for access to this. This is, a, this is a lease site in Storm Bay. You can see where the track of the boat is. And a couple of things to come out of this. First of all, away from the lease site, well away from it, you can see that the levels of ammonium you know, are pretty close to zero down here. Um, just, so there's just not much in the, there at all. You have to be much closer to the site to pick up any uh, real ammonium. And even then, it's extraordinarily patchy, no doubt due to whatever the vagaries of tide, current, uh, wind would be at the same time. The bottom graph shows um, samples taken from 7.30 in the morning to four o'clock in the afternoon at about two hour intervals uh, at the same spot um, uh, in, the, in the lease site. And if you look at the surface water here, there's almost an order of magnitude difference over that, over that 12 hour time frame. Again, showing that there's enormous space-time variability um, in the um, availability of ammonia in terms of standing concentration. Some similar work that was done on the other side of Bruni Island in Don Fricasto Channel is probably more what you might expect. The dark bars, these are just two different times, the dark bars here represents the lease site. Um, and you can see we're in a much more sheltered uh, site uh, and less water movement. Um, it's, it's probably what most people would expect, you know, concentration of ammonia right adjacent front to the site. You don't have to get very far away at all, though, before you're back in these blue levels down here, you know, well below the levels that the, that the kilt require. A really good thing to do, though, is to look at what the concentrations are in the tissue. So macrocystis takes up um, ammonia a bit easier than um, nitrate. Um, if you look at the ammonia in the tissue, you can see there's almost twice the concentration um, in the kelp tissue, in the kelps that we were growing at the fish pen compared to um, at, the, at the fallowed sites. There's no significant difference at all in the nitrate and nitrite um, there. There's some pretty complicated things going on in the nitrogen story here. And I think for me to fully understand this, I'll probably need to chat to someone like Katrina Hurd, who has a much a deeper understanding of some of the enzyme regulation of this um, metabolism. But this, this overall integration pattern here is exactly the one, is the one that we expect. The $64 million question though is what does this mean in terms of growth? So these data, uh, the growth of these um, kelps at these three different sites. Again, the fish pen on the left, the fallowed side in the middle and then the right hand side fallowed with the um, ex extra nutrients at four months, 13 months and 18 months after these kelps went out and just reminding you that they went out only one or two millimetres um, in length. So even after four months, we can see that, um, I mean, a couple of things to come out of this top graph. 
first of all, they certainly grew larger, had grown larger at the fish pen than at the other sites, but also look at the massive range here. Um, so the now these, these ones after four months, these top ones here are up at um, uh, 60 centimetres uh, in, 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 uh, in length. Um, just showing again this sort of genetic diversity that, uh, that uh, the difference in the different genotypes as to how well or not um, they're growing. Um, if we go at, at 13 months, again, this, this massive range, and at 13 months, some of them are reaching the surface. These lines are down at, at 10 metres. So this photo on the right here comes from this particular sampling here. And this, the, the main line here is at 10 metres, and some of these guys are reaching, um, are up there reaching the surface. We're starting to see that even though we've just got tiny amounts of osmocote strung along these lines at this fallowed site here, that these guys are actually pulling away from the site 500 metres away that didn't have that extra nitrogen. And by the time we get to 18 months, we can see that uh, you know, we've, got, we've got individual kelps uh, there that are up over four metres, typically a bit over 2.5, whereas the ones at the fallowed site without that added nutrient, even though these are, even though these are just tiny amounts of nutrient um, through this osmocote here, um, these guys mostly are only at about one metre. There's no graph here because unfortunately a storm came through and ripped all this apparatus out just before this, um, this particular um, uh, sampling. But we do know that most of those kelps were at the surface because the guys who were working the farm was, were telling us that they needed to drive their boats around the kelp to, um, to avoid it. So after 18 months, most of the kelps at this site were up at this you know, 10 metre or longer. Um, and you know, the same genotypes uh, at the fallowed sites, you know, barely making a metre. That's a really stark demonstration of just how nitrogen limited um, these, uh, these kilts were. So concluding from all this, in terms of warm tolerance, different family lines show marked differences in their tolerance to warm water as microsporophytes. Um, not surprisingly, the crossed lines did better than the self lines. For these microsporophytes, if we selected them, the ones that we selected as being tolerant and put them out, um, we were able to demonstrate that out in the field, they absolutely thrived over what was classified last year as a quite a warm summer. Um, and I'm quite confident that we'll be able to improve thermal tolerance here if we keep this selective breeding going over another you know, three to five generations. I expect it'll take about that long before it plateaus out. In terms of the nitrogen story, um, ammonium around the fish farm lease sites is temporarily and spatially variable. I think there's no, that, that seems to be pretty, pretty clear now looking at the collective data, not just ours, but the stuff that Jeff Ross and Camille and the, and the CSIRO folks were, were collecting. Um, the tissue ammonia story though reflects what you would expect in terms of an integrated signal of ammonia availability, much higher at the, at the site where the fish have been grown than away. Um, but it's really clear that giant kelp is nitrogen limited in Storm Bay and by inference everywhere else in, well, not everywhere else, but most, just about everywhere else in Tasmania. Um, but also that you know, an important takeaway point is that the giant kelp growth looks like it can respond you know, to even minimal increases in nitrogen availability. And we saw that where those kelps you know, hung adjacent to those small amounts of osmocote. So in summary, um, I think aquaculture of giant kelp in South Australia is, does require future proofing in some way against the warming trend and low nutrient availability. I think we've demonstrated that we can select genotypes for warm tolerance. Um, and we are suggesting that we move, uh, consider doing this work offshore where you can irrigate the lease with water that's drawn up from directly below the uh, aquaculture site. And you, know, you probably don't need to bring up that much water. Our next steps are to do this at pilot scale. I think we need to approach this very, very carefully with lots of measurements to make sure that you know, there's no adverse environmental um, effects of this sort of small scale artificial upwelling. Um, we don't anticipate seeing it, but it's certainly important, I think, um, that, that we do that. And I thought this is the last slide. I thought I'd leave you with this. This is just the um, data from the CARS Atlas. So this is the CSIRO regional 
sees atlas, uh, atlas for, for nitrate. Unfortunately, the scale here is a bit hard to see um, in terms of the differentiation that we're looking for. This one micromolar level here, which is at about you know, level 16 on this scale, um, it's kind of the crucial level, but it's the same sort of blue either side of it, not that helpful. What, what you can see though, and maybe it's not a, obvious to everybody's screen, but there's sort of darker patches down here and, and, and in these areas in Bass Strait, which are indicating levels you know, well below one micromolar. So this is at the surface, five metres, 10 metres, 20 metres. And it's not till you get down to sort of you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 metres that you can see that um, we, you know, we're well up above the one micron level. And in fact, in some cases above two, and we know from some sampling in places like Storm Bay that once you get down to 80 or 90 metres, you know, depending on the time of the year, you can pick up way more than even two micromolar um, per uh, um, uh, two micromolar um, nitrate. There's obviously not much ammonia out there. So I think that there we, we do need to think about um, being how we might generate this artificial upwelling if we don't. Um, then there's not going to be enough nitrogen to, de to derive uh, kelp growth at, um, at, at commercial scale and at the kind of level that we would require for economic viability. Thanks, that's pretty much all. Okay, thanks a lot, Craig. That was an a interesting presentation and um, we've got a whole bunch of questions. A lot, the sort of the questions seem to come in a little bit after the talk, but we've got some um, sort of generic questions that are coming through that we might um, hold to the end um, and get some of the panelists to sort of wade in on. One of the ones that has come through, though, that that um, pertains to what you've been up to, Craig, is around hatcheries, and and is it possible so if the if these companies want to go offshore and if there's enough nutrients and the temperature is right and they want to produce you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of tons of of macrocystis does the technology to upscale in terms of hatcheries do you think that sort of exists or can exist in a short period of time Craig short answer is yes I think the hatch look the hatchery the hatchery is not the main issue here I think um uh, I mean, we're obviously not doing this at commercial scale, um, but you know, people are growing kelps, including macrocystis, at commercial scale uh, elsewhere in the world, um, and there's certainly other kelps. And it's the same kind of technology. Um, look, it is it is quite technical to get it right, um, but it, the way that you scale this stuff, um, you just put in, you effectively put in more units, more modules, in, you know, into the hatchery. Uh, you don't. You know, it's it's not there are not major thresholds in scaling. Um, you can do it in a module sort of a approach, and I think that the technologies are well are sufficiently well worked um, uh, to be able um, you know, to be able to do this. I think we'd probably we we do it in a very clean but not azenic environment, and I think if we're really to get super high quality, high consistency product out of the hatcheries. We probably need to think about, you know, going as close to azenic as possible um, to really get that, you know, right. That would certainly be Hortamare's view. There are that's a commercial hatchery company operating out of um, out of the Netherlands. Uh, they they had some issues with consistency of product until they went azenic. Um, you know, we've had not, never had any problem at lab scale stuff without going azenic, but <coughs> still we do keep it very clean. But look the. Yes, the short answer is I think that it's not the real issues here. Not is not the hatchery side of things. The real issue here is uh, what technologies are you going to use to grow these things offshore? You know how are you going to harvest them? We've heard from Sunny. You know that's that's one way. There's other ways to you know to consider. I think probably what Sunny's doing is probably the smartest way of doing it. But you know we know other people are considering other ways of looking at this, um, and we know that these uh, whatever we put out there you know has has to uh, withstand some pretty significant wave events. So those kelps that you've just seen on, on my photos, they survived and that apparatus survived two 111 and 110 metre wave event in the period that they were out there. Um, but uh, you know, I mentioned that we, you know, we lost this, we lost one lot, well, Hewan lost one set of those lines. Um, they, you know, they are massive Dyneema lines. 
uh, and there was one storm event that took that took them out. So, um, you know, there's tech, there's some technology to develop out there. I think the other research, as I said at the end, look, I just don't see us being able to do this at commercial in a commercial way, in an economically viable commercial way, without the added nutrient. Um, uh, the simplest way to do that is use wave energy to pump nutrient up from you know, 80, 90 metres below. Uh, and there's a whole chunk of work that needs to be done uh, around giving, uh, giving the scientists and then giving the community the surety that there's not going to be any adverse environmental effect, effects of doing that. So, I mean, for me, those are the next two big research steps, you know, the technology offshore um, and the environmental work around the pump. Well, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, I think we'll, we'll probably end it there. And, and I, I, I will say that the, um, the question around sort of social license and the environmental impacts and sort of environmental services that large scale kelp farming might bring, that's one of the sort of themes of the questions that we'll, we'll sort of bring and, and tie together at the end. So thank you very much, Craig. Um, we'll now move on to our, our last speaker of the day, which is uh, Thomas uh, Remini from the a Southern Ocean Carbon Company. Um, the Southern Ocean Carbon Company, similar to um, um, the other two companies we've talked about, are, are, are looking at farming um, the giant kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera, along with some other species. Uh, and Tom's their uh, director of research. He's got a, a, a good background, as you'll see from his, um, his bio in terms of biogeochemistry and has worked a lot in um, climate impacts. Um, so I think we'll now hand it over to Tom, if you're available. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Can you hear me there? Yep, perfect. I think everybody's a bit webinared out, uh, sorry, uh, slideshowed out. So I'm just going to talk to, to this now. Um, now, our company, Southern Ocean Carbon, has I've, I've been learning about all of this stuff uh, for the last almost, almost 20 years now. Um, listening to the experts like Craig and, and Brian and Phil Boyd, who I see is on the line and, and the other experts at IMAS. And then I moved from that biogeochemistry and marine science space into doing climate impact assessment of uh, the CMIT archives and, and high resolution assessments on the terrestrial ecosystems. And I just saw that the rate of, of dramatic change that we were having was so da dangerous that I needed to stop telling everybody how the world was going to burn in my impact assessments and move into a space where we actually start trying to solve the problem. And as, as Brian showed, the scale of the, of the carbon, the additional carbon that's in the atmosphere is large compared to terrestrial um, forests but tiny compared to what's available in, in terms of if we, if we industrialize the ocean as a solution. And it was actually his presentations in uh, sort of three years ago or in this space that really um, got me thinking, well, we've got to start doing it. We can't just be saying, look, here's some good ideas. We've got to start building that solution. And so I've, I've shifted some of my energy into trying to build that as a commercial offering to the market because if it's not at commercial scale, it's not gonna work. It can't be done at, at, as, as a, a donation-based activity. It really needs to be at that commercial scale. And I, I think that was quite clear from Brian and from Sonny's uh, presentation before me. So then we teamed up with a marine engineering company that were trying to off, offset their carbon and they couldn't do it. They couldn't actually find anyone that was providing um, carbon offsets, even in the voluntary market. And so they started thinking about, well, how could we do this? They also found some of the work that Brian had done and the like and said, well, how about we try and do that? And as marine engineers, uh, you know, safety backgrounds, they knew how to build the equipment. They knew how to manage the people at sea, but they didn't have the science. And so we teamed up together and that's what we're working towards. And I think most of what has been presented today is exactly what we're after. It's after reforestation because we know that we've, either harvested out all of the kelp or it's been killed by a warming um, events, even though there are those, those remnants around, which as, as uh, Craig presented, um, are crucial for really trying to figure out how to reforest those areas and give those remnant communities uh, almost an insurance policy to make sure they can continue trying to reseed those areas. 
And so that's a really big part, big um, part of our, our vision as well is, is reforestation. How can we make, make sure that that's a, a big part? And because of that, gr that rapid growth rate, sucking up carbon as rapidly as possible in the immediate term, even before we think about sequestering it, just getting it out of the atmosphere and into something else that is solid is crucial in the immediate term for, our, for the sustainability of, of our current climate. And so those rapid growth rates those, and, and doing that at rapid scale in the immediate future is really what needs to happen. As Sunny mentioned, that means we need lots and lots of people doing this across the world in lots of different locations. Um, and the only way we're gonna be able to do that is, is in the ocean um, because the land is already so uh, fraught with difficulty either because it's uh, being used for, for food production or for housing. So our, our organisation see this as, as a way of, of moving forward and I'm not going to reiterate all the science that everybody else has so um, really easily articulated over this time. But so we've been really focusing on the operations, setting up hatcheries. Uh, the hatchery we've got at the moment is, is uh, set up in collaboration with the Department of Education. Um, this is a good, this to us is crucial for building that future workforce as well. This needs to be at massive scale. So we need lots of people that can do this work. And so starting at, at, the, at the high school level, giving those um, kids um, the opportunity to um, join, in, join in this either immediately out of school or to go through the university program and come in at different levels um, higher up is a really big part of what we think is, is the other part, the social part of the solution. I, the, Using these offshore forests, and as Craig mentioned, understanding the, the longer term impacts of, of changing these, uh, these biogeochemical cycling of, of deep ocean nutrients, I think is a crucial thing to get on top of. It's one of those things that, you know, Professor Phil Boyd and Andy Bowie and the other team, other people have been involved in those sort of large scale iron fertilization um, sort of investigations um, have been uh, investigating and worried about for some time. And I think we do have a real issue as, as an industry of potentially creating another problem. And we need to make sure we figure we get a real sense of what that problem looks like, the scale of that problem, and how we can make sure we mitigate any of those longer term issues in this uh, attempt to uh, mitigate the, the carbon dioxide issue in the atmosphere. Well, in the immediate term, we don't, it's, there is no agreed methodology for turning blue carbon credit, uh, creating blue carbon credits from growing kelp. And that's a really big challenge um, to overcome in the immediate term. So one of the things we could do instead is we could grow the kelp and then turn it into things that are seen as, as carbon credits, such as using biochar facilities. So getting that new um, growth, taking that growth, putting it through biochar, using waste heat to, to cook it um, from various industrial processes is one of those things we can do in the immediate term. Um, that also has the potential to be used for terrestrial um, waste, uh, biological waste as well. But it's one of those things that I'm really all about. How can we do this as quickly as possible, create the market as quickly as possible, working with the other people interested in this market um, uh, so that we created an ecosystem of, of companies that are supporting each other's rapid um, pathway to scale because that's that's the key thing that, would, that the planet needs right now and that as far as I can see there's uh, two other companies um, that are doing that and not many others if you look around the world. So our work uh, at Southern Ocean Carbon is very similar to what's, what's happening with the other communities. Uh, I think the best um, approach to that that uh, we can use for offshoring this activity is going is still going to come out after future research and this is the crucial part of blue economy crc try a few different pilots see what's going to happen see which of these things is really going to take off um, as as the most sustainable long term and we want to be part of that solution forever um, as well and and make sure we can build that commercial um, element that allows this to scale um, outside of the research sector. Um, I'm acutely aware of the question, of there's a lot of questions to answer, Lindsay, and I'm quite happy to, to cut it short there for um, my contribution. So then people like Craig, before he runs off, can actually answer some of those questions and, and Brian and Sonny get their chance as well for those questions. 
Okay, well, uh, thanks, Tom. Um, that's 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 great. Uh, yeah, there are a number of, of sort of themed questions um, coming up, um, particularly the the one around sort of social license, and not just social license. So um, also about like what's being done around the sort of R and D to actually take this this technology and, and take it offshore. Um, I should say that the for those of you who aren't aware of what the blue economy CRC is trying to accomplish is that, that it's exactly that it's um, facilitating the R&D that will enable companies like um, uh, the three that you've uh, we've highlighted today um, to take their um, technology offshore um, and to undertake the research needed to make sure that we understand what the environmental impacts are to understand what the environmental services that these kelps might provide would be, but also to undertake the, um, the research into the engineering uh, needed um, to, to do this. So I guess I'll, I might just uh, throw it open around the, the question of social license. If, if Obviously social license is a very complex matter given that we're talking about multiple jurisdictions and different kinds of people that you're interacting with. But um, in terms of social license for growing seaweed, large scale seaweed farming, which hasn't happened in Australasia before, would, would one of you like to sort of comment on, on your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give it a go uh, first up. Um, I just wanted to also make a previous point of what you had just said about engineering and taking things offshore. So in terms of what Kelp Blue is doing, that's actually what we're doing now. So our founder is an offshore engineer. We have a number of engineers we work with. We are working with Hotamare and a range of other groups to do this. So our pilot as it is will be um, the largest offshore um, one that we have. And there is already research being undertaken there. So in terms of social license, I think, um, as I was saying before, when it comes to this scale, that's something that I've thought a lot about with my background in um, oil palm and communities. Um, it starts with the private sector being open and transparent about what they're doing. And it can't be a factor of out of sight, out of mind. There's the technology there. We really need to be um, providing communities, be they local communities or global communities, key access to what it is that we're doing. And that's kind of the reason that we have also developed that Kelp Forest Foundation. So it can be supporting the academic research, but also um, social engagement. And I think it's a really challenging area. And in some ways, I don't think, um, for example, uh, when it comes to large offshore kelp cultivation and kelp forests, like we're doing something I forgot to mention, sorry, I get terribly nervous before these talks, um, is we will actually have no surface infrastructure. So, you know, it's, it's attached to the bottom. How that's done really depends on research of those local conditions. But then from that 20 meters to above, we may have demarcation buoys that's dependent on um, government regulations or ocean monitoring equipment. But apart from that, it's just kelp. So in terms of visual amenity, that's not there. I mean, my ideal is, um, I had a great conversation yesterday with someone from the tourism sector in Tasmania, is when we're not harvesting, this should be an area where people can fish or scuba dive or do these type of things as well. You know, it's, it's really important um, when it comes to the ocean, this is something that belongs to everybody and it's something that people need to be able to know what's going on. But again, it is a long process of building trust. If I may, um, Lindsay, I'd like to add to that, that you know, there have been efforts over the past couple of decades to look at, um, you know, do we need to add nutrients to the ocean to really regenerate these kelp forest ecosystem services offshore? And it's our understanding that there's plenty of nutrients in the deep sea. And in terms, there's a far greater degree of social acceptance to not have to add any additional nutrients, but simply restore natural upwelling, which occurred pre-industrially. And getting back to a healthy climate that occurred pre-industrial is a great model to be able to scale in the near term, because heaven knows we don't have a lot of time in terms of years to actually correct the situation before the potential exists of the kelp forest to go functionally extinct in uh, Australia. 
Um, Craig Johnson can probably speak to that more eloquently. Nonetheless, we have the opportunity to uh, regenerate and restore and that level of social acceptance we see is far greater. And so it's a matter of charting a safe path forward that can use pre-industrial natural ecosystem services as a precedent to really move forward in an integrated way that can help to rebuild ecosystems and rebuild the forage fisheries that occurred pre-industrially as well. I think, uh, yeah, I think there's, there's sort of three issues with social license. One, one is typically around, at, at least from the perspectives um, that are aired publicly in the Tasmanian community. One is around lifestyle amenity, and that's to do with visual amenity, sound, that sort of thing. Uh, people don't like big, ugly, noisy structures out on the water in front of their homes. Um, recreational amenity, they, they don't want, uh, they, they don't want uh, aquaculture activities taking up their favorite fishing spot or yachting spot or swimming spot. Um, uh, and then the third concern is um, you know, the, any environmental impact. So certainly by moving offshore, um, you, you, you largely remove the issue around the recreational amenity. Um, and as both Sonny and Brian have alluded to, uh, you can actually provide recreation, positive recreational amenity there because we know that as soon as you have a kelp forest, you're gonna attract uh, an enormous range of other biodiversity, including fishes and and uh, um, and other invertebrates, um, and and there's nothing above the there's nothing that sits above the, the water surface, so the visual impairment's not there. In terms of environmental impact, um, well, uh, you know, I've always felt that if you really want to clean up a body of water, plant a kelp forest. Um, we know that we know that the environmental uh, there are a lot of environmental benefits. The more kelp you grow. Uh, in many ways, um, the more, um, you know, the, the better the, the marine environment um, can look. There's not a detrimental effect of kelp on marine um, environment. Having said that, I think we do have to be careful about um, uh, what happens when we bring up, I wouldn't say water from the deep sea, but you know, water from moderate depth, 80, 90, you know, 100 metres underneath uh, a kelp aquaculture plot. Um, if we bring that water to the surface, um, we do we do have to just tread carefully there. Make sure we do the science well. Make sure we do the modelling properly, um, just to to give not just the scientists I think, but the community um, uh, a, a really strong sense uh, of security that um, that sort of thing is is going to be actually okay from an environmental point of view. When I talk to my colleagues who are biogeochemists, who are phytoplankton ecologists, zooplankton ecologists. They say if you're bringing up those kind of volumes from those sort of depths, they're not anticipating any issues at all. Um, but nonetheless, I think we actually have to put in the hard yards, do the science properly, and then we can demonstrate in, you know, with clear evidence um, what that impact might be, if any. Um, and I, I think unless we do it like that, uh, we, we run a risk of not getting the social licence to do this sort of thing. Um, as Western diets move more towards using kelp as a food product, um, you know, we have to start thinking about the messaging around this, that the, in any environmental impact of using protein from kelp is minuscule compared to the environmental impact of using protein from beef, for example. Um, so if it's overall environmental impact and if there's trade-offs involved, there is actually sophisticated discussion to have here. And in that sophisticated discussion, I have to say that um, aquaculture of kelp, offshore growing of kelp, starts to come out looking pretty, pretty good. Yeah. The only thing I'd add to that is I, having the social license and managing that from the outset, I see it as crucial because there are very few alternative ways that we can suck up the required amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere in this in the, at the speed and at the scale that we can using seaweeds and using kelp forests. And so therefore we can't stuff this up. If we stuff it up, we actually make it really, really hard to achieve our goals long-term. Okay, great. Hey, thanks, thanks guys um, for that. Uh, I think we've probably um, touched on, on much of that. And, and I would say that um, the Blue Economy CRC uh, is, is obviously like really engaged with 
with research around social license and about environmental impacts and environmental services that, that offshore aquaculture can perform. And one of the questions was about the difference between the difference between social license and potentially impacts of, of farming kelps as opposed to farming animals. Um, as a seaweed biologist, I'll say that, you know, farming seaweeds is about the best thing you can possibly do. Um, <laughs> as, as many of us will tell you. Um, I, sorry, my um, Zoom feed just dropped and the whole Q&A thing dropped out for me. I've only got two now. So um, I will say um, we're sort of uh, drawing to an end. There's a couple of questions. One um, was about sort of opportunities for businesses to sort of potentially get involved. If you're interested in this uh, in a non-seaweed business for any particular reason, um, contacting um, uh, either Irene Penesis or uh, John Whittington um, through the Blue Economy CRC would be a, a really good first step. Um, and I think um, we're probably, there's some, there's a few questions about, um, as there always are, around uh, multi-trophic aquaculture, um, the potential for uh, farming uh, seaweeds associated with other species. Um, I, I guess actually if Chris Carter, if, if your, um, if your microphone's uh, working, um, I wonder if, if you might like to, so Chris Carter is the, um, the program leader of research program to the, um, seafood and marine products, uh, within the CRC. Um, and we've talked quite a lot about IMTA. I wonder if Chris could sort of uh, speak to that a little bit. Oh, uh, thank you, Lindsay. Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So I think IMTA and the things that could lead to IMTA are really important for the Blue Economy CRC. The bid in itself was constructed around a vision of of an IMTA almost in an offshore region. So it, it it's something else than than salmon cages um, offshore. It it was exactly that to have um, ecosystems. Um, in other places. So we, we see the value of being able to do that um, at various levels. And first of those would be what you've just discussed in terms of the kind of um, community acceptance, social license, whatever you want to call it, that, that it en enhances this idea of offshore uh, marine production. Um, so, so there's that aspect of it. Um, we're also keen that if we're in this offshore environment, that we do have those mechanisms for being able to sequester all types of nutrients that's important to us and the opportunity that's provided by some of those different species for different purposes so as we've talked about you know seaweeds in themselves can be used in multiple ways um, but we're keen to be able to develop some of the other species that can use those seaweeds as some of our speakers have spoken to about so it's definitely a very um, exciting um, part of what the blue economy would like to do and it, it kind of reflects what others have thought about as well. So th thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. Um, I think, um, as I said, my sort of feeds fallen out and a lot of the questions have been answered by the speakers. Um, I think we're probably um, about ready to sort of draw this to a close, um, unless I can see some other pressing questions. Any of the speakers like to sort of add anything um, um, before we uh, draw this to a close? Yes. Um, if you can, Lindsay, can you hear me okay? It's yeah, yeah, you're, you're fine. Now. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. No, I think uh, there's an enormous opportunity for IMTA. We're uh, highly encouraged by the fact that it's possible to, um, to, to look at, for example, the operations of a commercial um, fish pen type operation. Uh, and, and look at the amount of nitrogen that can actually be drawn down by kelp forests surrounding such an operation. That presents a huge opportunity to uh, provide the kind of nutrients. I mean, the fact that uh, Professor Johnson demonstrated, you know, four times the linear growth rate, along with uh, Dr. Kane Layton um, and Matsuya, um, to enable such a replete uh, growth of kelp to be regenerated during even higher temperature conditions represents a huge opportunity. And of course, for every hectare of fish, you could probably have multiple hectares of uh, kelp forestation in the future with uh, substantial economic returns. So we see this as a strong synergistic opportunity. There is interest in exploring 
IMTA with mussels, with uh, other shellfish, and I think with finfish, uh, perhaps could be some of the most promising opportunities. And that enables the opportunity to share infrastructure as well. And that would extend further with, for example, offshore wind that's being developed across Europe, now the US and potentially in the ANZAC region. Uh, we should be looking at uh, how to integrate these offshore installations commercially and enable them to scale. And I think there are enormous synergies to doing an integrated co-design. And many of those shellfish related ones also have um, they're sequestering carbon in the shells as well. So it's we, you know it's a it's a it's a win-win in that kind of context. So yeah, the the potentials there are for how this can really provide a much more sustainable food production system. Um, long term is just enormous. I guess like my final point would maybe to be bringing it back to the purpose of this talk was considering is seaweed an option for unlocking the blue economy and I think um, if you actually think about what that means the blue economy it also invokes ideas of stewardship and ensuring that you know we are leaving this area better than when we started so I think as a private sector company um, and that is all the participants of, her, <laughs> of the blue economy of, outside of the researchers. I think we really need to be taking this seriously and um, really looking at the methods of development and ensuring we're trying to pursue what is best in terms of the environment and the community as well. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sunny. And thanks to all our presenters today. I mean, the, 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 the purpose of today's webinar well, there was several purposes. One, of course, was to sort of let people know um, what's going on in this space in Australasia. Um, um, but also for us within the CRC to sort of, we, we want to start to socialize the idea that the CRC isn't just about um, salmon and other things, um, but also um, that we are thinking about this sort of um, multi-trophic approach to, to offshore aquaculture. Obviously, there's a whole nother side to the CRC around um, renewable energy uh, and, and um, marine renewable energy um, offshore. One of the big projects they're about to start on is, as Brian pointed out, around looking at what we're calling um, uh, marine carbon offsets. So as we go offshore and we're farming uh, seaweeds or, or producing renewable energy, like what, what is the, car what the carbon offset uh, potential for that? Um, and so sort of what, watch that space for um, uh, potential to uh, collaborate uh, there. Um, okay, so I've just been told, yeah, so um, one of the questions was, uh, is this webinar and, and the recording of this webinar actually publicly available? And uh, I'm assured that all the speakers and everyone else have said that that's okay. So there will be a link to the recording of this, this um, webinar on the Blue Economy CRC website, and hopefully you can share that link um, for those who are interested. Um, thanks so much uh, for everyone's participation today and thanks so much for the speakers for um, not only speaking but also answering the lots of questions that came through and we've still got about 140 or 150 people uh, uh, still engaged so thank you for all for showing up. Um, our next CRC webinar is tomorrow afternoon um, on offshore wind um, energy production. So hopefully many of you have also decided to attend that. Um, and other than that, I think we're about ready to sign off. Um, thank you very much to all our speakers again, and thanks to the CRC for hosting this webinar. Um, and uh, from New Zealand, uh, it's almost seven o'clock, so good night. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks for your thanks time, everyone. everybody.